Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. See now the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and warrior, the judge and prophet, the soothsayer and elder, the captain of fifty and man of rank, the counselor, skilled, craftsman, and clever enchanter. I will make boys their officials. Mere children will govern them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old, the base against the honorable. A man will seize one of his brothers at his father's home and say, You have a cloak. You be our leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. But in that day he will cry out, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. Jerusalem staggers. Judah is fallen. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. The look on their faces testifies against them. They parade their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them! They have, been, have brought disaster upon themselves. Tell the righteous, it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked! Disaster is upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. Youths oppress my people. Women rule over them. Oh, my people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. The Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Amen. Let's pray, please. Our Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you, thanking you for this holy word, thanking you for this message, and thanking you, Lord, for these people who are here to receive it. May your good and perfect will be done. May what is said here, Lord, be pleasing to you. May we draw near to you, Lord. And may your Spirit give us wisdom and understanding. This is for your glory, Lord, and your glory alone. For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Is there hope? Is there hope? Isaiah wrote during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah in Judah. He had several kings, and for the most part, this was a time of fairly reasonable prosperity. Isaiah was called the Masonic prophet, if you will, because he talks about the Israelites as a Masonic nation to the world. They were supposed to be the ones who was going to bring the Messiah to the world. They were going to be a blessing to the world. And he talks about the Israelites' nation through whom one day a great and wonderful blessing would come from God to all nations. Hallelujah. He was continually dreaming of that day, the day when that great and wonderful work would be done. He's also been called the Shakespeare of the Old Testament because of his wonderful writings that he's put in there. Bad times are coming. But Isaiah contrasts that with the Messiah and the coming of the church. Time and time again, you can see it. When you read it, if you just let the Spirit speak to your heart, you can see how he continually talks about the coming of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Today we're in Isaiah 3. And since this was a time of material prosperity, the people of Judah have become very slack in their spiritual lives. I think that's pretty much the way of mankind, humanity in general, don't you? You know, everything is good, everything's great, 
no problems, healthy. Most of us don't think much about God when that's happening. But let something go bad. Let us get sick. Let something happen in our families. Let something happen around the world. And who do we call on? God Almighty. Why aren't we calling on Him and thanking Him when things are good? That's mankind. Isaiah gives them here a picture of the judgment that God would bring upon them because of their sin and their spiritual apathy. Actually, I think that this chapter can be directed against the United States and our problems today. So I want you to bear with me. And I'm going to do a little comparison. I want you to think about what I say. Really think about it. As we look at chapter 3 today, I want us to remember the fact that most of us learn our lessons from our mistakes, don't we? We, make, we all make mistakes, and that's how we learn most of the time. If we're not learning from our mistakes, then truly we are very seriously have a problem. <laughs> but I got to tell you, sometimes I struggle with that. You ever make the same mistake over? How many has ever made the same mistake over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least you people are honest. <laughs> some reason, some things we just don't learn by our mistakes, do we? But thankfully, most of the time, we do learn from our mistakes, right? But we live it today in a time of chaos and trouble. You can see it. You don't deny it. Let's be honest. We, we have so much chaos and so much trouble. But that doesn't mean that we can't serve God in a mighty way. Not at all. We live in a day and an age where teenagers and children don't seem to understand respect. In fact, I think a lot of the problems that we're having today uh, with the policemen and other is because not only do people not respect the policemen, but the policemen aren't respecting the people. There's a loss of respect in general. We live in a day and an age when, where men aren't expected to act like men. If we act like men, people point their fingers at us. And women aren't expected to, to act like women. Haven't you noticed that? We've allowed everything to sort of become gender neutral. In fact, they're talking about some places of not having a men's restroom and a women's restroom and just have a restroom. I'm not really going to go and debate that because it could be good, it could be bad, but the problem is not the restroom itself, it's the fact that they're trying, the world's trying to tell us there's no difference between men and women, but there is a difference. And it's not necessarily bad, it's just God made us that way. He made us different. So what has happened? What's happening to us? Well, the same thing that's happening in the USA today, it happened in Jerusalem and to Judah. When we abandon God, He will allow things to happen that's not good for us and will lead us to our utter destruction. And we've abandoned God, he'll let us go. He'll call us, he'll try to pull us back. But in the reality, it's up to us to believe him and hear him and accept him. Is there hope? Is there hope? Well, what about, think about this. What about respecting people? In verses 1 through 8, Isaiah is saying that qualified men for high positions would be lacking. Did y'all catch that? And this will be a judgment from God. The fact that people who are qualified, people who are men who are qualified and able to have a high position, they will not be there. And this is a judgment for God. You know, the cream is supposed to rise to the top, right? Everybody knows that. Cream is supposed to rise to the top, the rich, good part. Well, the cream will not want to rise to the top or take a high position means that hardship and frustration will come with that position because people are rebellious. People aren't going to want that position. 
Because everybody's going to make fun of you and give you a hard time and not listen to you. So why would you want that aggravation? Why would you want that position when you're not going to get any respect, you're not going to get anywhere, and you need the people to listen and to understand, or you can't do anything but have trouble? I think we see that today in our land today. Many godly men do not want to lead in the church or in the government because it's a burden and not a joy. God has made some people to lead, but because of the state of the sinful people, they will never fulfill their God-given desires. We then because they do not want to lead, you know what we inherit? Bad leadership. Somebody will fill the position. And if the good people, the honorable people, the people who are qualified, the people who we would like to be our leaders, if they're not willing to do it, what does that leave? People who are not qualified, people who are doing it for the wrong reason, People who couldn't care less. The U.S., I think, lacks greatness in this day. The U.S. is not the same country it was. We're not as great as we used to be, but we're not willing to admit it because we've become a very proud nation. When little men leave long shadows, then we know that the day is soon gone. Men in positions of leadership will act like children, no self-control, totally incompetent. Children shall rise against the older generation. No rules, no standards. If it's old, it means it's no good, it's outdated. And the cities will be ruined. In Isaiah's time, the younger generation had lost most of the respect for the older generations and many things. They thought their religious uh, traditions, the way they worship, was stupid and outdated. Therefore, they followed the religions of the nations around them. The younger generation thought thought that their government policies and, and their economic policies were also outdated, so they did their own thing. The result was no one wanted to lead. They were losing at everything. I have to ask you this question. Does that sound familiar? I'm talking about Israel here in Judah. But you may think I'm talking about the United States. Do the right thing. There is hope if we will do the right thing. Obviously, these people that Isaiah were talking about were not like the Pharisees. Jesus, uh, when he was discussing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he had a a totally different problem. Uh, They do not hear, they do not bother to appear to be pious at all. They couldn't care less about religion. They couldn't care less about God. They were not pious at all. Their demeanor and their actions clearly showed that the religion of the covenant had no place in their hearts, in their government, in their life. They couldn't care less. Note Isaiah's des- his conclusion. He says, woe to them. Woe to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. Their own sins will bring judgment. They will not escape. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, God will not be mocked. He will not allow sin and injustice to go unpunished. And they have no one to blame but themselves. 
the younger generation didn't know right from wrong. It was difficult to live righteous because no one else was living righteous. The righteous were outcast. It is difficult to do the right thing when there's no incentive to do the right thing. It's hard for you and I to do the right thing when the right thing is looked down upon and made fun of. And there's no incentive for us to do the right thing. It's difficult. God will allow His people, though, to suffer the consequences of our disobedience. Things will grow worse and worse. Probably Isaiah is alluding to the harem of the kings when he talks about the women governing, suggesting that his many wives and concubines are the ones who are actually running the government or running the country. He also may be saying that the rulers are not acting in their masculine role as leaders should be. They behave as women of vanity and weakness. The problem is bad leadership. That's what it says. Oh my people, your guides lead you astray. They turn you from the path. The leaders who are to be models of righteousness, leading their peoples really in the ways of the Lord. That's what leaders are supposed to be. They're supposed to be models of righteousness, leading their people to the Lord. But instead, they're models of rebelliousness, turning their people from the path that leads to God. Whatever indignation the Lord has for the people who have rebelled against Him, be sure that it will be much worse for those who use their leadership to lead people away from God. So God holds court to pronounce judgment on His people. Lawyers know that how they present their case depends on how much they know the judge. Any good lawyer knows every judge that he would ever be for. He knows uh, whether he's strict or easy. He knows what the judge likes and dislikes. Some judges are known to be very strict, while others are known to be lenient. Some judges are more severe on some crimes, but other crimes they're a little bit easier on. A lawyer defending a known criminal hopes for a judge with a very lenient disposition. Isaiah makes it clear that you don't want to be the lawyer defending the elders and the leaders of his people in this situation. You don't want to be their lawyer. God has already judged in the sense that he has seen the ruler's sins and he understood them for what they were. The judging that he is doing in the court is a kind that a judge does when he's made his decision and now he's rendering the verdict. Here's the verdict. It is you. It is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. He's saying, you're the rulers. You, you're the rulers. You are the criminals. God's vineyard is his covenant nation. That is the nation of Israel. These rulers have ruined his vineyard. I wouldn't want to be standing in their shoes before that judge, but it gets even worse than that. They have plundered the poor. The poor. How how low can you go? They not only fail to help the poor and protect the poor, which is what God has told us to do, is to help the poor and protect the poor. They plunder The poor, whatever meager possessions they have, may it be as very little, they actually take what the poor has from them. And they were brazen enough to leave that in their houses. I think it's the next lines that convey God's anger. You can tell what kind of verdict a judge is about to say when he impresses upon the defendant the nature of his crime. He says... What do you mean by crushing my people 
and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Boy, when my mom and dad said that way to me when I was little, I knew I was in for a spanking for sure. What do you mean by doing that? Crushing my people, grinding the faces of the poor, you can tell God's not very happy with them. I want you, did you catch the personal tone here? These rulers are ruining my vineyard. They have crushed my people. You certainly don't want to find out that the family that you just terrorized happens to be the family of the judge. God takes the crimes personally. And I think the last phrase is a most ominous declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah concludes with a reminder of the greatness and the power of the judge. The sovereign God, the Lord, is the covenant God of Israel and Judah, and He is the Almighty. You don't want to mess with Him, and you don't want to mistreat His people. Because he takes it personally. So today, let's think about this for a second. We can easily apply this passage, I believe, to government leaders. They need to realize that they are responsible before God to govern with equity and justice and compassion. Would you not agree with me on that? They need to realize that they hold greater accountability because they are models and they are guides. Occasionally, you will hear a a public official complain. I've heard some public officials complain. He says that their sins, their lives, are scrutinized more closely and judged more harshly simply because they're a public official. Well, yes! If you don't want somebody to look in the closet of your house, you better not run for public office. Because they're going to look in every closet. They're going to look at everything that you've ever done. With authority comes responsibility. And the greater the authority, the greater the responsibility. But the most appropriate application of this I think is to be made in the church. God's complaint here is against the rulers of his people. He's concerned with the state of his covenant people, right? Under the new covenant, who is God's people? The church. We are the covenant people. We are God's people. And there are church leaders who literally plunder their people. They steal church money. And they use money given in faith for their own selfish gain. They will be held accountable before God for plundering his people. There are also church leaders who lead their people astray through the teaching of the false gospel. Some teach the health and wealth gospel. They crush the spirit of God's people. People who are suffering, going through trials, and, and they're called to righteous living in the midst of ill health health and loss of loved ones and or maybe they're just poor and yet the church these leaders are saying you don't belong to God you have no faith you see these leaders they they lead their churches astray believing that the sign of a church that's favored by God or blessed by God is a church that's wealthy 
and that everybody in the church is wealthy and healthy and buildings are the real indicators of success. They lead their people astray from living in the service to God to live in their own welfare or the welfare of the leaders. Some teach a Christless gospel. They say that Jesus, he's not the Lord and Savior. They say he's just a good man. They teach that they don't proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He's not proclaimed as a Son of God incarnate. And yet they're called Christian churches. They rob their people of the only hope that they have for redemption. They receive the condemnation that Jesus made of the teachers of the law in Luke eleven fifty two. 52. Woe to you. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. Some lay upon their people heavy burdens. They teach that salvation must be earned. That you must earn your salvation by keeping rules and doing good things and good works. Both of which they make it more and more strict and harder to do. They teach their people to live in constant fear of losing their salvation if they're not doing enough, if they're not good enough. If they do not keep these rules and follow the teachings of the commands of the leaders, then they will lose their salvation. That's what they're teaching the people. They will also receive the same judgment that Jesus gave against the teachers of the law. Jesus said in Luke eleven forty six, 46, he says, And you experts in the law, woe to you. Because you load people down with burdens that they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Brothers and sisters, leadership in church is a position that you should never take lightly. The responsibility is great because accountability is great. But having said that, the, the reward is also so great. Of what greater reward can there be than to be called to shepherd God's people? If I've got to take care of some sheep, let it be God's sheep that I'm taking care of. What greater blessing is there than to minister the Word of God to His people? It makes it so much easier because I can always say it ain't my Word, it's God's Word. Hallelujah. You can argue with me about my Word, but you better not argue with God's Word. As surely as there is judgment for wicked leaders, so there will be blessed fruit. For the righteous who lead their people along the path of the gospel. So that's what keeps many going. There is great accountability, but there are also great blessings. So in conclusion, God says that he will let his people continue to go farther and farther away from him until they reach Rock bottom. Sometimes I'm sad to say that's the only way many of us will ever turn around and go back to the Lord is when we are so low we can't go any lower. What a shame that we do that to ourselves. What a shame. We don't have to go to rock bottom, but somehow we do. The nation will destroy itself. We can see many similarities between Israel and the USA. Keep praying that the USA will not be like Israel was. Please pray. Christian people have allowed things to get this way. We, we ourselves, we're guilty. We've allowed things to happen. What do we do? What do we do not to end up like Israel? 
Well, maybe there's at least two things we could do that was in the sermon. Maybe we can start respecting people and showing others how to respect. Let me tell you something. Brothers and sisters, if you think that you have to receive respect to give respect, you're already thinking like the world. You be respectful no matter what the non-believers do. You show them that you are respectful. And the second thing that we can do is do the right thing. No matter what the world is doing, no matter what your neighbors are doing, no matter what your friends are doing, you do the right thing. You say, well, what's the right thing? Very easy. Obey God. Two words. <laughs> it's not a great secret. It's not a great formula. It's not something that we don't know what to do. Just obey God. That's the right thing. If you can respect people and do the right thing by obeying God, there's hope. Hallelujah. There is hope. Let's pray.